the beginning, there was nothing. Then, a land called Filheim, the land of fog, sprang into half the universe. The other half was filled by Muspelheim, where the air itself burned with fire. Where the two regions met was the great void, Ganunga Gap. It is there a peaceful river flowed, spreading into the depths of the void, where it began to freeze, forming layers and layers of ice. The heat from Muspelheim lit the cold of Filheim till the energy spawned the great frost giant Ymir, the first of all the frost giants. Muspelheim was guarded by a flame giant named Surtur, who carried a great flaming sword. When Ragnarok came, it was Surtur who would lead the fire giants out of that wretched land. Meanwhile, on the other side of the universe, Filheim lay in a dark mist, and Ymir began to grow and grow when the sparks of Surtur's saber caused the ice to melt. At the same time, life began to grow in the form of a cow named Aldhumla, the nourisher. Her udders were swollen with rich milk, and that milk flowed into four rivers, which Ymir drank from. Aldhumla was so large that her legs stood as columns in the universe, holding up the corners of space itself. She began to lick on the salt that had formed on the crust of the ice, and after three days, the first god finally sprung forth, named Buri, the producer. From then, the sweat from Ymir's arms began to create the first of the frost giants. The god Buri would have his own son named Bor, and as they met the giants, an eternal battle began, one that is still waged to this day. The war between the two would end in a stalemate every day until finally Bor married a giantess named Bestla. The two would have three sons, Billy, Ve, and Odin. And now, finally, with three new gods on their side, Bor was able to defeat Ymir, the source of all the giants. When Ymir died, a massive flood of blood burst forth covering the entire earth and all the evil beings that lived on it. After Ymir's death, Odin and his brothers would shape the world itself from his body, creating the sky from his skull and appointing the four dwarves, Nordri, Sudri, Austri, and Westri, to hold up the four points of the sky. Ymir's hair was turned into trees and bushes, his brow turned into walls to protect the gods from the giants, and in the center of those walls was Midgard, the land where humans would eventually live. After the Great Flood, nearly every giant had died, but two named Bergelmir and his wife managed to escape and find asylum at the edge of the world. It is here he would found the land called Jotunheim, the realm of the giants, and it is there he would father a new race of giants. Odin and his brothers continued their work creating the clouds, stars, and seasons out of Ymir's corpse. Then they would take the brightest of the remaining stars and join them together to become the sun and the moon, sending them out into the darkness in gleaming gold chariots drawn by magnificent white horses. Midgard is now finished, and Odin was crowned as king of all the gods. His brothers would receive new names, Vili and Ve, being renamed as Honir and Loki. The trio would roam the empty earth, until one day on the ocean shore, it looked across the silent sands and noticed two pieces of driftwood lying on the ground. Immediately, the brothers shared the same thought and rushed towards the driftwood. It was Honir who reached the first piece, and his shadow sprung across it, giving it arms and legs. Loki did the same for the second piece. Finally, Odin arrived, bent down, and blew divine breath over the first piece of wood. Out of that bark came the first woman, and out of the second came the first man. Odin had given life to the first humans, but it was Loki who would give them the power to see, taste, smell, hear, touch, and even more importantly, the power of understanding and consciousness. Finally, Honir gave them the power of speech. Odin would name the man Ash and the woman Elm for the trees they came from. All humans today are descended from these first two. After the creation of the first humans, Odin created the realm, the gods, and named it Asgard. Asgard was built to be perfect, with endless palaces and thrones made entirely of gold. The realm itself shone with the light of a thousand suns. Once Asgard was completed, 
the gods built a massive rainbow bridge to reach it from Midgard. It would be known as the Bifrost. Asgard was home to the Aesir gods, but Odin's family was not alone in the cosmos. A second family, known as the Vanir, constructed their own realm called Vanaheim. And as time went on, tension between the two families grew. Finally, war broke out. A great battle over who would rule the cosmos was waged, and by the end, a truce was signed. Each side would take hostages from the other. And so the Vanir gods Njord, Frey, and Freya came to live in Asgard, while Honir, one of the founders of the universe, went to Vanaheim. Asgard, Vanaheim, Midgard, and Jotunheim are all bound together by the massive world tree Yggdrasil. Its branches hang over the nine worlds, and its roots stretch down to the edges of existence. The roots of the Yggdrasil are managed by the Norns, three sisters who control the fates of all things. Each of these roots leads into a separate realm, the first into Asgard, taking its strength from the Well of Weird, the second to Jotunheim, drawing from the Well of the Giant Mimir, which grants great wisdom to all who drink from it. The third and final root ends at Filheim, and the well that feeds it is Velgelmer. Black and poisonous water is slowly eating away at the root. And even worse, a great dragon named Nidhogg sits at the base and viciously attacks it. Even now, at the beginning of the universe, the signs of his decay are in motion. Ragnarok is coming. In the Nine Realms, Odin holds ultimate power and refuses to accept that Ragnarok is inevitable. This inability to accept his fate will drive Odin to the edges of the world tree in search of knowledge and power. One such story is the time Odin longed to know the secrets of the ruins. With these arcane powers, he could perform powerful acts of magic. In order to acquire such knowledge, however, a horrific sacrifice must be undergone by the Seeker. Days later, Odin had hung himself by the neck of the world tree. For nine long days, he stood there, swinging in the dark, freezing winds, hanging above existence itself. It is said that the otherwise fearless Odin screamed with terror and pain that could be heard throughout all the Nine Realms. Finally, his ordeal was over, and Odin became the master of magical ruins. He was willing to do whatever it took to win at Ragnarok and this trial would not be the last sacrifice he would make in the name of wisdom. Odin was not a strong man, but he had something far more important. Wisdom. When he sat on his throne in Asgard, two ravens named Thought and Memory perched on his shoulders and brought him news of all the activities happening in the universe. Since the beginning of time, Odin began to prepare for the coming of Ragnarok. He knew that he would need the greatest warriors in the world by his side when that fateful day came. So he set about building Valhalla. Valhalla, the home of the chosen slain, was to be Odin's greatest palace. The walls were made of glittering spears, polished until they shone like the brightest silver. The hall held 500 massive wooden doors, each wide enough to allow 800 warriors to pass through. In the Great Hall were huge banqueting tables, where the fighters favored by Odin and his Valkyries would feast every night on a boar that was killed and reborn each day. After the meal, the chosen warriors would fight and battle to train for the apocalypse. Each injury healed instantly by Odin's enchantments. Odin's wife Freya was known as the Mother Goddess and she watched over the Nine Realms by Odin's side. Freya is known to have a good heart, but even the kindest of the gods, the dark side. She was proud of her appearance, and usually was content with the jewels and gifts that Odin would give her, until one day in Asgard, she saw a golden ornament that had been fastened to a statue of her husband. Freya was overcome with greed, and as night fell, she snuck out of her palace and stole the necklace. She gave it to the dwarves and asked them to create the finest of all necklaces. And when it was finished, it was the most beautiful piece of jewelry ever seen on any woman. 
Unfortunately, once Odin found out that his decoration had been stolen, he flew into a rage. He summoned all of the dwarves involved and furiously demanded they tell him who stole the necklace. The dwarves remained silent, however. Their loyalty to Freya more important than their own lives. Odin swore to find the real thief by daybreak and began to put together runes that would allow the statue to talk and betray the thief. When Freya heard of his plan, she trembled with fear, so she called to her favorite servant and begged her to find some way to protect her from Odin's wrath. Hours later, the servant returned with a hideous and ugly dwarf who promised that he could prevent the secret from being revealed in exchange for Freya smiling upon him. In the morning, Odin awoke to find the guards around his statue drugged and asleep, while the statue itself lay in pieces, smashed. Odin was furious. He left Asgard in protest, taking with him all the enchantments he had laid upon the realm. In his absence, the perfect home of the gods and the realms around began to freeze. The frost giants began to invade the earth, and massive sheets of ice and snow began to cover Midgard. Birds, cows, and men all died as wind and snow howled in Odin's absence. For seven long months, Asgard and the realms around stood frozen, till finally the last hopes of gods and men began to die. It was only then that Odin returned. When he saw the damage that had been done in his absence, he forgave the thief and his wife and began to bless the Nine Realms once more. The frost giants retreated and warmth returned. He showered Freya with love and gifts and she once again took her place by his side as Queen of the Gods. Freya and Odin would have several children their eldest son was the god known as Thor. Thor would often travel to the edges of the kingdoms with a sheet of lightning in his hand, endlessly fighting trolls and giants. His wife was a goddess named Sif, who held dominion over all the fields of Earth. The second son of Odin and Freya was named Baldur, who was beloved by all. Baldur was the epitome of light, while his blind younger brother, Hodur, was the representative of darkness. The final son of Odin was the most courageous and bravest of all the gods, the god of war and honor named Tyr. Asgard was filled with many other gods, but for now, only two are important to know, Heimdall and Loki. Heimdall would watch over the Bifrost Bridge, always on guard for the sound of an enemy approaching. He was the most loyal of all the gods. And Loki, well... Loki is the personification of trickery, deceit, and mischief. In the unchanging, perfect realm of Asgard, Loki is the flaw. He begins with harmless tricks. By the end of his story, his acts will become more and more evil until he commits an unforgivable sin. Odin had learned the secrets of the ruins and prepared Valhalla to gather the courageous fallen to his side. He knew, however, this was still not enough to win when Ragnarok came. So when his ravens told him of a certain well that gave the drinker wisdom, he knew he needed to drink from it. One night, Odin took up his cloak and staff and followed the route of Yggdrasil until he reached Mimir's secret well. Mimir was a giant after all, and it was not right that a giant should be wiser than the Allfather. Good day, Mimir. I have come for a drink from your well. Mimir refused him. No one would drink from the Well of Wisdom without paying the price. Odin, in turn, promised to pay him whatever he wished. Mimir's eyes gleamed. He knew that the gods were the eternal enemies of the giants, so he demanded the highest price he could think of. Odin could drink from the well, but he would have to leave behind one of his eyes. Odin hesitated. But as he looked at the well, his decision was made. Mimir filled the horn for the Well of Wisdom and handed it to the god. Drink then. Drink and grow wise. 
This hour is the beginning of trouble between your race and mine. Upon drinking, Odin became wiser than anyone in the Nine Realms, aside from Mimir himself. Then, true to his word, he gouged out his own eye and left it in the well. Odin would stop at nothing to prevent Ragnarok, and soon his sacrifices would not be contained to his own body. Kvasser was the world's first poet, so wise that no one could ask him a question to which he did not know the answer. This is because he was created by both the Aesir and Vanir gods, formed as a symbol of their unity after their mighty war for control of the universe. He would travel the length and breadth of the entire world, bringing wisdom and joy to everyone he crossed. It is said that every poet or scald alive today has a drop of Kvasser's blood in him. Such was his wisdom. One day, Kvasser was invited to dinner by two devious dwarves, and while he was there, they asked him to come into a corner where they could ask him a question. When Kvasser walked over, they killed him on the spot. The dwarves were envious of his powers and had heard a rumor that his blood was more valuable than gold, so they mixed his blood with honey, turning it into a magical drink. Whoever drank Kvasser's blood would become as wise as he was and be able to speak in the most eloquent of poems. Truly, this was a priceless treasure. The dwarves, however, were not finished. Next, they invited the giant Gilling to come out to sea with them. And of course, when they were far from shore, they drowned the giant who could not swim. When they told his wife of the accident that had occurred, her cries were so annoying to the dwarves that they killed her too. Finally, the giant's son, Satung, was so enraged that he found the dwarves who carried both out to sea, saying that they would die as his father had. The dwarves cried and begged for mercy, finally promising that if he could let them go, he could drink from the mead made in Kvasser's blood. Satan agreed, and so now he took control of the kettles of mead, telling his daughter to make sure no one could steal or drink from them. One day, in a field owned by Baugi, Sutton's brother, an old man approached the servants who were toiling away. Your sides are dull. Shall I wet them for you? The servants gladly agreed, and when the job was done, they began to argue over who could buy the whetstone from the man. Let him have it who catches it! The men fought viciously for the stone, and when the fighting was over, every one of them was dead. Now, the old man walked quickly towards the home where Baugi lived. When Baugi, Sutton's brother, came home, complaining that there was no one in his fields, the old man offered to do the work of all nine men in exchange for a price. What is the price which you ask? I ask that you get for me a drink of Suttung's mead. Baugi knew that this old man must be a god, so he desperately wanted him to work his fields, but he knew the mead was not his to give away. At last, however, they made a deal, and all summer the god worked the fields. When winter came, Baugi brought him to Satung's home in a cave deep in the mountains. When they arrived, however, Satung refused to spare even a drop of his mead to a god, the enemies of the giants. So the god concluded that he and Baugi must get the mead by force. Baugi surprisingly agreed to help him, and the god gave him a drill to make a hole in the wall so they could break through. Baugi drilled and drilled, drilled, and after making a hole that was nowhere near large enough to travel through, he declared that the hole was done. The god asked him sternly to drill a deeper hole. This time, when Baugi was done drilling, it was still too small, but the god declared that the hole was complete, transformed himself into a snake, and slithered right through. Baugi jabbed the drill in anger at the hole, for he had tried to trick the god by drilling it too small. The god slithered into the cave where Sutton's daughter was protecting the mead and proceeded to use all his charms on the woman. She fell for him and agreed to his deal. He would sleep with her for three nights if she gave him three drinks of the mead in exchange. She knew she was betraying her father, but the god's charms overcame her feelings of loyalty. Once the three nights were over, the god who was of course Odin in disguise, drank all of the mead in three enormous gulps, 
transformed into an eagle and returned to Asgard. He then proceeded to throw up the mead into several vats so he could bless future poets with the power of Kvasar's blood. During this process, several drops of the mead fell to Midgard, and from these came all the mediocre poets and artists of the world. Kvasar's mead was a valuable treasure, but it would not be the last one that the gods obtained. Sif, Thor's wife, had sparkling golden hair that was envied by all who saw it. One day, the trickster god Loki decided to cut off her hair for no other reason than to cause trouble. When Thor found out what Loki had done, he flew into a rage, seizing Loki by the throat and promising to break every bone in his body. Loki begged and pleaded with the God of Thunder, who finally agreed to release him on the condition that he would have the dwarves forge for Sif, new hair made of real gold. Loki met with the master craftsman Ivaldi and had the golden hair forged along with a magnificent ship which was so big it could carry all the gods yet so small it could be folded up to fit into a bag. On top of the ship and the hair, Ivaldi and his sons also created Odin's spear, Gungnir, which never failed to hit its mark after being thrown. Loki still could not suppress his desire for mischief, however, and before he left, he went to a rival dwarf named Brock and bet him his own head that he could not make an item better than the one that Ivaldi had made. When Brock went to create his items, however, Loki repeatedly turned into a fly and bit the craftsman, causing several defects. When Loki and Brock arrived in Asgard, the gods had them present the items they had created. First came the hair, the ship, and the spear from Loki. After them came Brock's creations. First was a magical ring called Dropnir for Odin, second a magical metal boar for Frey, and thirdly a hammer for Thor. Like Odin's spear, Thor's hammer once thrown would always find its mark. Unfortunately, because he had been bitten by a fly while creating it, the handle was shorter than usual. Despite this, the gods declared that the hammer was the greatest treasure of them all, and that Brock had won his bet and was entitled to Loki's head. Loki protested and begged, but Brock was unrelenting. When Loki attempted to run, Thor caught him and returned him to the dwarf. Finally, Loki found a way out. I promised you my head, but not my neck! So it was that Brock sewed Loki's lips together to prevent him from any further mischief. Loki had many different children. Sometimes he was the father, and at other times he was the mother. He even gave birth to Odin's eight-legged horse Sleipnir, but let's not talk about that now. With the giantist Angraboda, Loki had three children. The first was named Hel, who was a goddess that would rule the underworld and all the dead in it. The next was Jormungand, the giant serpent who encircled all of Jotunheim on the edge of the world. The final child was named Fenrir, a hungry and loyal wolf that would grow and grow and grow. As Loki's three children grew up in Jotunheim, Odin ordered that all three be brought before him. When he saw how large they had grown, he was filled with fear. He immediately banished Hel to the underworld and threw Jormungand into the ocean. Fenrir, however, presented a problem. The wolf was so large that Odin and the gods decided they must raise him in Asgard where they can keep an eye on him. Of all the Aesir, only the god of honorable combat, Tyr, was brave enough to go near the giant wolf to feed him. Fenrir, despite being a child of Loki and raised in Jotunheim, was loyal to the gods and trusted them unquestioningly. Finally, the gods decided they could not allow the wolf to grow any larger and decided to deal with the monster for good. They presented Fenrir with a chain and said that they would tie him to a post and let him break free so he could demonstrate his strength. The wolf eagerly agreed and snapped the chain without even trying. The fearful gods had a second chain forged, stronger than the first, presented it to the wolf. This time, Fenrir became wary, but he was still eager to prove his strength to the world. Finally, after much struggle, he triumphantly broke through and howled in his victory. The gods now began to worry. Their suspicions about Fenrir's strength were all too true. They sent a messenger to the dwarves 
and had them construct a chain for the wolf. The result was a fetter named Gleipnir, which was forged from the sound of a cat's footsteps, a woman's beard, the roots of a mountain, a bear's tendons, a fish's breath, and the spit of a bird. All things that no one had ever encountered, and therefore all things that could never be tested. The gods took Fenrir to a remote island in the middle of a lake in Midgard and presented him with a third chain, a tiny silk cord so thin it was almost invisible. Fenrir suspected trickery, but did not want to be called a coward. He agreed to be chained, but only if one of the gods would place their hand in his mouth as a pledge against deception. The Asgardians all looked to the side and refused to meet Fenrir's eye. All except Tyr. He stuck his hand inside the beast's mouth, feeling the razor-sharp teeth laying on his wrist. Gleipnir was tied around Fenrir, and the more he struggled, the tighter the bonds became. He was unable to break free, and all the gods but Tyr burst into laughter at the sight. Betrayed, Fenrir bit off Tyr's hand in anger. Fenrir howled and howled, and for eons, he has struggled against his imprisonment. He would have no hope of escape until Ragnarok came. The gods had dealt with Fenrir, but now Thor intended to deal with another of Loki's children. Thor is the protector of Asgard, and would frequently travel to Jotunheim to endlessly fight the giants on their home territory. However, sometimes he traveled to Jotunheim in order to get the aid of certain giants. When doing so, he would travel in disguise so that his enemies would not recognize him. One day after the chaining of Fenrir, Thor traveled to Jotunheim hoping to defeat another of Loki's sons. He planned to obtain the head of Jormungand, the massive serpent who encircled the entire realm. Thor disguised himself and set out for the house of the giant Hymer, who lived on the rugged and bleak coast. Thor offered to help the giant with his fishing, insisting that he could row further and stay out longer than the giant could. Hymer laughed, for Thor was disguised as a youth from Midgard. However, he still agreed to let him come. Thor took the head of an oxen as bait, grabbed the oars of the boat, and began to row, startling Hymer with his speed. That's enough rowing. We have reached my usual spot. But Thor kept rowing, and rowing, and rowing. As the shore disappeared, Hymer began to protest again. If they continued, they would surely reach the dreaded serpent that dwelled at the edge of the world. Thor finally set down the oars, laid his line, and cast the enormous hook with the oxen's head over the side of the boat. Hymer trembled in fear as the wind picked up swirling around the god and the giant. Suddenly, a faint rumble could be heard from the depths, and then it grew louder and closer and louder and closer, the fishing gear on the boat clattering back and forth as the vibrations seemed to shake the foundations of the earth itself. Finally, there was a great crash, and the line began to jerk and sway as Thor attempted to reel in his catch with all his strength, bracing his feet at the bottom of the boat. Jormungand's massive head rose from the waves, his eyes burning as he gazed upon Thor. The snake spat venom at the god, who quickly dodged it and drew his hammer, preparing to deliver the final blow. But it was prophesied that neither of them could kill each other until Ragnarok came. Hymer, trembling with fear, cut the line with his fishing knife, allowing Jormungand to swim free. Thor was enraged and knocked Hymer overboard. After he could see the giant no more, Thor abandoned the boat and swam back to shore, determined to kill the serpent when Ragnarok arrived. Thor failed in his quest this time, but the next time he went to Jotunheim, he was lured in by Loki. Freya owned a set of wings that allowed the wearer to turn into a hawk, so of course, Loki decided to steal the wings to try them on. He flew through Jotunheim in the form of a hawk, finally coming to the hall of a chieftain named Gerard. When Gerard spotted the hawk flying around his rafters, he ordered his men to capture the bird, and Loki mischievously flew around the servants, taunting them. Suddenly, Loki's feet stuck to the wood, as if by magic, and he was caught. When Gerard looked into the hawk's eyes, he saw the spark of intelligence. This was no ordinary bird. So, suspecting trickery, Gerard locked Loki away in a trunk for three long months. When the giant finally released the god, he would receive all the answers 
he was looking for. Loki desperately told him the truth and begged him to spare his life. Gerard made Loki a deal. He would let him live, but only if Loki could convince Thor to come to his hall without his hammer. Loki agreed and immediately set off for Asgard. He convinced Thor to come back to Jotunheim with him and told him his plan of how they could defeat the giant together. On their way to Gerard's hall, the two deities would stay at the house of a giantess named Gerd. When she heard of their destination, she gave Thor a metal rod as well as a pair of iron gloves as gifts. Finally, they made it to Gerard's hall. The giant promised them that there would be great entertainment. All they had to do was go to the barn where the goats were kept. He instructed Thor to take a seat in the only chair in the barn, a place of great honor. When Thor sat down, however, the chair began to rocket up towards the ceiling, and a second before he would have been crushed, he pulled out the metal rod that Gerd had given him and pushed against the ceiling with all his might. Then, two horrific snapping sounds, followed by shrieks of pain, were heard. Thor's chair had been lifted by two of Gerard's daughters, and in stopping his rise, Thor had broken both of their backs. Thor and Loki left the barn for the Great Hall, and it is there that Gerard challenged the Thunder God to a wrestling match. The fight began viciously, but suddenly Gerard grasped a pair of iron tongs from the fire and hurled them at Thor, a dirty tactic. Thor reached up and grabbed the red-hot tongs with his iron gloves and threw them right back at his opponent. Gerard attempted to dodge the attack, ducking behind a pillar, but the God of Thunder threw the tongs so hard they went straight through the pillar, through the giant, through the wall, and finally landed on the ground outside. Thus died Gerard the Giant. In that myth, Loki helped Thor, but in the next one, he would help Odin steal from his own wife. Freya is walking through the mountains and has seen something very strange. A craggy boulder that is typically standing upright has been knocked over, showing the entrance to a tunnel. She looks into the tunnel and notices that inside is several dwarven forges. On this day, the dwarves were creating a golden necklace inlaid with the finest jewels. Before she even realized where she was going, she had walked into the cave, began to talk to the dwarves as they worked. The goddess offered to buy the necklace from them, first with gold, then silver, then any other treasure they asked for, but the dwarves refused. Finally, the goddess said she would do anything to get the necklace. Anything. The dwarves looked at each other and smiled. They would give her the necklace, but only if she agreed to spend one night with each of them in turn. Freya was repulsed by the dwarves, but desired the necklace so much that she agreed. Four days later, Freya returned to Asgard with the necklace, pretended as if nothing had happened. However, Loki soon learned the truth of how she had obtained it and immediately went to Odin to tell him. Odin commanded Loki to steal the necklace. And so as night fell, Loki transformed into a fly and slipped through a crack in Freya's door. The goddess was sleeping on her back with the necklace underneath her. So Loki bit the goddess on the neck, causing her to turn to one side. He quietly transformed back into a god and carefully peeled the necklace off her neck, tiptoeing out of the room in silence. In the morning, Freya stormed into Odin's court and demanded to know where her necklace was. Odin said there was no way she could get her necklace back. Freya said she would do anything for the necklace. Anything. Suddenly, as if Odin had just thought of the idea, he proposed that she put 40 kings against one another so that many great heroes could be slain and brought to Valhalla. Freya agreed, and soon after, a mighty war began. The necklace was returned, and she would wear it proudly until the end of days. In that story, Freya was nearly exiled from Asgard. But this next story is about the exile of Odin. The gods have decided to erect a statue of Odin in the center of Asgard. For this, they have commissioned a team of expert dwarves to create a statue made entirely of gold. When Odin was presented with it, he was so proud he had it placed in the entrance to his court so he could see it every day. Odin's wife Freya, however, soon grew envious of the statue. She desired to own the gold herself, and so one night had several smiths melt down all of its gold in order to make jewelry for her. When Odin awoke, he was enraged. He had all the smiths executed, and once the statue was rebuilt, he cast secret spells over it. Freya had been disgraced by Odin's response, 
So, of course, she decided to sleep with one of her male servants and make sure everyone knew about it. Then, she convinced that servant to destroy Odin's statue and hide all of the gold it was covered in. By now, the gods who had once admired Odin began to despise him. His wife had put him to shame, and his inability to prevent the statue's destruction showed his weakness. The gods decided that their leader's honor had abandoned him, and so they banished him from Asgard. For years, Odin remained in exile, traveling up and down the branches and roots of Yggdrasil, until one day, terrible news reached him. His brothers, Vili and Ve, had taken over his position as king of the gods. They had divided up all of Odin's possessions, but had decided to share Freya. Years had passed since Freya's unfaithfulness and jealousy. Odin could barely remember why he was mad at her. Images of her face swam in his mind, and with his sword in one hand and staff in the other, he returned to Asgard. He immediately fought his way past the guards and deposed Vili and Ve with a great display of power. The gods now had little reason to doubt his divine right to rule, and so Odin was once more king of the gods. While Odin was away in exile, his brother-in-law Frey had taken advantage of his absence. Frey is sitting on Odin's throne while Odin is away. He thought it would be a funny joke and that nothing bad would come from him sitting in the Allfather's seat. From his position, Frey could view the entire cosmos and watch over all the Nine Realms. This was highly entertaining and Frey was enjoying himself until he turned his eyes to Jotunheim. His eyes grew wide and he could barely breathe. The ugly and jagged terrain was contrasted with the sight of the most beautiful maiden he had ever seen as she walked through her father's fortress. Her skin glowed with all the radiance of the sky and Frey fell completely in love with her. For days he refused to see anyone until eventually his father Njord grew concerned with his son's absence. Njord sent his favorite servant named Skirner to check in on his son. The servant reminded Frey that they had been friends for many years. He told Frey that it was safe to confide in him. Frey told Skirner everything about the giantess, her appearance, her walk, and her skin that glowed like the sky. He could not sleep, he could not eat, there was nothing in the cosmos that would please him but her. Sadly, he knew that there was no way a giant like her and a god like him could ever be together. Skirner stood up boldly. If I can help it, there will be a way. Lend me your best horse and your sword that fights by itself. I shall go to the stronghold of her father and win her hand on your behalf. He rode long and hard over the dark and desolate hills of Jotunheim, until at last, the giant's fortress came to view. As he rode, the roof and walls of the fortress began to shake and tremble, and the giantess Gerd ran out of her rooms in fear, asking one of her servants who was approaching. Skirner entered the hall and found Gerd there to meet him. Who are you? Are you an elf? A god? How did you ever find our remote stronghold? I am not an elf, nor a god. These will be yours if you will consent to be the bride of the great Frey. Gerd refused, saying nothing in the world could cause her to desire Frey. Skirner tried again. He pulled out the golden ring of Odin's, from which eight more golden rings fell every ninth night. This will be yours to keep if you accept my master's offer. Gerd again refused, knowing that her father had more gold than she could ever wish for. Skirner's face now darkened. He took the sword from his bag. See this sword? By it your father shall fall. He then pulled out a magic staff and began to curse the giantess, promising that she would lose all her beauty and be accompanied by nothing but sorrow, loneliness, and rage for the rest of her life. I never would have thought it possible, but I am filled with longing for Frey. Tell him I will come to him after nine nights, and we shall be married. And so when nine nights passed, Frey and Gerd were married. Frey and Gerd had a happy ending, but this next story has a very dark one. A great king had two sons, Agnar and Gerard. One autumn day, when Agnar was ten and Gerard was eight, two boys were fishing at sea in their boat. Then, a strong wind abruptly picked up, and blew them far from shore. When dusk fell, they finally made it to land, but only after their boat was destroyed on the rocks. The boys were alone in the vast wilderness, surrounded by an unending darkness, broken only by a single orange light in the distance. They finally made their way to the light, shivering with cold and groaning with hunger. 
When they arrived at the cottage where the light came from, they were welcomed by an old man and woman who lived there. All winter, the princes stayed with the elderly couple. The woman would teach Agnar all she knew, while the man concerned himself with Gerard. When spring came, the boys finally departed, and as they entered the boat the couple had given them, the old man whispered something in Gerard's ear. After sailing for hours, the brothers could finally see their father's mansion. But when they had almost reached the shore, Gerard jumped to land and quickly pushed the boat back out to sea, cursing his brother. Gerard strolled into the mansion, and after finding out that his father, the king, had died, he told his family that Agnar was also dead. So it was that Gerard was crowned king. Many years later, Odin and Freya sat in Asgard, looking down on Midgard. Odin pointed to Gerard's kingdom. See what has become of Agnar, your foster son? He dwells in a cave. But look at my foster son, Gerard. He is a king and has won great renown. Your Gerard is the most miserly king who has ever reigned among men. When he has too many guests for his liking, he tortures them to death. Odin scoffed. The suggestion that his foster son had turned out to be stingy and dishonorable was laughable. With that in mind, he made a bet with Freya, and soon after, a stranger appeared in Gerard's realm. This man called himself the Hooded One, but would say no more about who he was or where he had come from. When the Hooded One came to Gerard's court, the king immediately had him arrested and tortured. Gerard promised he would never leave until he revealed his identity to the king. For eight nights, the Hooded One sat, silent as can be. But on the ninth night, as the king and his court were feasting, the king's son, named Agnar, for his lost brother, took pity on the Hooded Man and brought a horn of mead to the stranger. The Hooded Man drank the entire horn, and at last he spoke. For nine nights, I have sat here between these fires, and no one in all of Gyrod's kingdom has brought me anything to eat or drink but little Agnar. I tell you now, no one will ever receive a greater payment for a single drink than he. The hooded man began to tell the king and all who were present of the lore of the entire cosmos. The crowd was shocked that this unknown stranger had such vast knowledge of the universe. Gradually, the terrible truth began to dawn on them. There was only one man, no, one god, who could possibly have all this knowledge. They had been torturing the most powerful god in the universe, Odin, the Allfather. By the end of his speech, Odin turned to the king and revealed himself as the old peasant who had taken care of him so long ago. Gerard, you are drunk. Your stupor has cost you more than you know and more than you will ever be able to bear. I once saved your life, but never again will you receive any aid from me. I see in my mind your sword and it drips with your blood. Your reign is over, and the reign of your son Agnar has begun." The terrified Garad stood and ran to Odin with his sword in hand, but the sword slipped, and in that same instant, he tripped on the floor. The blade pierced him in the chest, pushed straight through his body. When the onlookers went to see Odin's reaction, there was nothing left but the ashes of his cloak between the two fires. Agnar's reign was long, and his story would be retold for countless generations. Another story that would be retold was the time that Thor fought against the giant's greatest champion. Krugnir was the strongest of the giants and their greatest fighter. One day, he spotted a lone rider coming towards his house. The man's golden helmet shone with the light of a thousand suns as his eight-legged horse approached galloping effortlessly across the air and water between them. The giant asked the man who he was to have such a fine steed, but the visitor did not answer his question, and instead challenged the giant to a bet. I would wager my head that there is no finer steed than mine in all of Jotunheim. This wagering of heads seems to be a habit with the Norse gods, they can't get enough of it. The giant was insulted and declared that the stranger's horse was no match for his own. The two furiously raced across the tundras and glaciers of Jotunheim, each pushing his horse to the limit. They continued racing until the terrain soon changed to fields and green valleys. Frungnir was so absorbed in the race that he did not realize the landscape had changed till he and his rival rode straight past the gates of Asgard and into its shining halls. Frungnir stared in awe at the homeland of the gods, 
and his opponent, who of course was Odin, invited him in for a drink. The giant soon became boastful and arrogant, ordering that all of Thorn's drinking horns be brought before him and drinking from them all. He threatened to rip Asgard apart and throw it into the ocean, sparing only Valhalla, Freya, and Sif, which he would take back home as his own. He went on to say that he would kill all of the other deities as well. First, he would do something even worse, drink all of their ale. When Thor arrived in Asgard and saw that there was a giant drinking his ale and making threats on his family, he drew his hammer and charged. But the giant quickly protested, saying he had been invited by Odin. He was entitled to protection as a guest. Thor glared at the giant. You dog of a giant, you will soon regret that you ever accepted that invitation. Great and mighty Thor, it would be awfully cowardly for you to kill an unarmed man now, wouldn't it? The giant proposed the two fight in single combat. After, of course, he went home to prepare properly. Thor agreed. By the time the giant returned to Jotunheim, word of the upcoming duel had spread far and wide. Either the giant's greatest warrior or the giant's greatest enemy would be slain. The stakes could not be higher. The giants of Jotunheim gave their champion a gift, a giant made of clay who was miles long and miles high. Meanwhile, Krungnir himself carried a massive shield and a whetstone the size of a cow. When the two entered the battlefield, they were a fearsome sight to behold. Luckily, Thor's assistant had arrived at the battlefield before the god, and he told Hrungnir not to hold the shield in front of him, for Thor would arrive any minute now from the ground below the giant. Hrungnir took him at his word. The giant put the shield underneath his feet. The sky darkened, and lightning began to flash in the distance, drawing closer and closer. Then, with a mighty crack of thunder, the sky itself parted and Thor leapt down out of the clouds towards Hrungnir, who promptly wet himself in fright. Thor threw his hammer down at the giant, who in turn threw his whetstone up at Thor, and as the two met in midair, the whetstone shattered in two. One piece flew back and exploded the giant's skull. The other struck Thor in the forehead and lodged there. Even worse, a piece of the giant's leg fell on Thor's neck, trapping him to the ground. Thor's assistant quickly slew the, the clay giant, attempted to pull the leg off his master with no success. When the gods heard of the champion's plight, they all rushed to his side, but no one could succeed in pulling the stone out or moving the leg off his neck until at last Thor's son, Magni the Strong, arrived. Magni had been born just three days earlier, but even as a baby, he was able to pull the leg off his father's neck. Thor was so happy with the boy, he immediately gifted him Hrungnir's horse. However, there was still the problem of the whetstone lodged in his forehead. He attempted to see a sorceress to get it removed, but in the end, she forgot the words to her charms. And so the whetstone remained lodged in his forehead until today. Even now, if you throw a whetstone across the floor, the one in Thor's head stirs and causes him great pain. Thor had beaten Hrungnir in a battle of strength, but the next giant he would face would be far more deadly because he would fight with his mind. Thor and Loki are traveling far from Asgard, and as night falls, they are welcomed into the home of a farmer and his family. Thor offered his goats as dinner, knowing full well that they would be brought back to life the next day. Before the meal began, Thor laid the goats' hides on the floor and instructed the family to place the bones on the hides once they were done eating. The farmer had two children, and despite Thor's instructions, the younger one, named Shalfi, broke open one of the goat's leg bones to suck out its marrow before placing it on the hide with the others. Early the next morning, Thor awoke. He brought the goats back to life, but something was wrong. One of the goats had a crippled leg. Thor flew into a rage, the entire house waking up to his screams of anger. He would have slain the entire family on the spot had the farmer not offered him his children as servants. Thor grudgingly accepted. And so he, the two children, and Loki all continued towards Jotunheim on foot. When night fell, the group made their way to a huge hall, and after finding no one inside, decided to go to sleep. Suddenly, they were jolted awake by a great earthquake. They ran out in a panic only to find that outside the hall was a sleeping giant whose snores were causing the very earth to rumble and shake. Thor clutched his hammer, preparing to slay the giant where he slept, when suddenly the enemy awoke. 
The giant, however, was more amused by the sight of Thor and his companions than threatened. He introduced himself as the Boaster, but before they could say their names, he said that he already knew who they were. He then picked up his glove, which was the hall they had just slept in, and said he would journey with them. The group was fearful at first, but grudgingly agreed that having a native to guide them through Jotunheim could be useful. The next night, they slept beneath a giant oak tree, and the giant fell asleep first. There was just one problem, however. He was carrying all of the group's provisions in his bag. Thor struggled to untie the knots, and became so frustrated that he grabbed his hammer and struck the sleeping giant on the head, intending to destroy him. The giant awoke, and calmly asked if a leaf had fallen on his head whilst he was asleep. Later that night, the giant's snores grew so loud that they began to echo off the valley like rolling booms of thunder. Thor grew so enraged, he once again tried to slay the giant by striking him on the head. And once again, the giant awoke, this time asking if an acorn had fallen on him. Right before the sun rose, Thor tried again to destroy the giant. And this time, the giant asked if some birds had roosted above him and shaken some dirt onto his face. The giant then departed from the group, and they pressed on towards a castle in the distance known as Utgard. When noon came, the four would reach their destination. Upon arrival at the castle, they found that the gate was locked, but Loki quickly figured out that because the giant's bars were so large, they could just slip between the large spaces. Once inside, they came to a hall filled with men drinking and feasting. Amongst them was their king, named Utgard Loki, who immediately began to mock his guests about their tiny size. Loki quickly stated that despite his and his companion's size, there was no one in the castle who could eat food faster than he could. Utgard Loki challenged the god to prove this boast by entering an eating contest with one of his men named Logi, whose name meant fire. A trough of meat was set between the god and the giant, and the two began to eat. Both reached the middle at the same time. However, the giant Logi had eaten the meat, the bones, and even the trough itself. Tjalfi then stated that while Loki had lost that contest, there was no one in the hall who could run faster than him. So Utgard Loki immediately appointed his man Hugi, whose name meant thought, to run against him. By the time Hugi reached the finish line, he was so far ahead of the Jalfi that he turned around and doubled back to meet his opponent. Thor then stated that while Loki may have lost the eating contest and the Jalfi had lost the race, there was no being in the Nine Realms who could beat him in a drinking contest. Utgard Loki had one of his servants bring a drinking horn and informed Thor that anyone who could finish the horn in one draft was indeed a great drinker. Anyone who could do it in two was fine, and he had not met anyone who was unable to do it in three. Thor drank, and drank, and drank. But by the time he paused for breath, the amount of liquor inside had barely moved. He gave it a second try, straining to drink as much as possible until once again his breath failed. Finally, he drank a third time, this time putting everything into it. By the end, over half the drink still remained. Utgard Loki gave Thor one final chance. He said if he could simply lift his cat from the floor, he would admit that he had great strength. But Thor was unable to do even that. Enraged, Thor challenged anyone in the castle to wrestle him. Utgard Loki appointed an old woman, Aili, whose name meant age, to fight him. And once again, Thor was unable to win even this contest. The group spent the night in the castle and in the morning they left the gates, humiliated by their losses. But once they were outside, Utgard Loki told them the truth of their contests and of their entire journey. Now that you have left my castle, I shall see to it that you never enter it again. The knot on my provision bag that you almost succeeded in untying had been wrought in iron. I used magic to deflect the blows you attempted to inflict on me with your hammer. Instead of my face, you hit the mountainside and carved three gaping valleys into it. Had you struck me, I would have been killed then and there. He then turned to Loki. You did well in your eating contest, considering that your opponent was none other than fire itself. 
When Shalfi raced, he fared well considering he was racing thought itself which no one could ever hope to outrun. When Thor drank from the horn, the far end was actually connected to the sea, and we became afraid that you might drink it all. My cat was actually the great Midgard serpent who you succeeded in raising out of the ocean and into the sky. And finally, you wrestled against old age itself and took a long time to fall. Now for your sake and for ours, leave and never come back. Thor was so angered by this trickery that he raised his hammer intending to destroy the giant and his castle. But when he turned to do so, he saw no giant and no castle, simply a large and empty plain. Thor and Loki managed to escape that time, but in the next story, Odin and Loki will be trapped and held hostage. Odin, Loki, and Honir are all traveling in Midgard following a river. Soon, they would come to a waterfall, and next to it, an otter eating a salmon. Loki picked up a rock and skillfully threw the otter. He giggled in delight, boasting that he had caught both an otter and a salmon in just one throw. Night began to fall, so the three tried to stay the night at a farmer's house. They offered him the otter and the salmon in the hopes of repaying him. However, when the farmer named Tridmar saw the otter, he cried out in anger, calling his sons to his side. These men who seek lodging with us tonight have killed your brother. What should we do with them? The three men glared at the gods in disguise and quickly tied them up so they could not escape. The otter had been Hridmar's third son, who had the ability to turn into one. As the farmer and his sons were sharpening their axes, Odin quickly made them an offer. If their lives would be spared, the farmer and his family would receive as much wealth as they desired. In response, Hridmar skinned the otter and said that if they found him enough gold to cover the skin, he would release them. And so Loki was sent to the land of the dwarves to acquire the gold. Loki immediately made his way to a river and caught a dwarf disguised in the shape of a fish, demanding that he give him all the gold he required. The terrified dwarf named Advari reluctantly agreed and led Loki to the rock where his gold was kept. He handed all of it to Loki, but attempted to pocket a single ring without the god noticing. We agreed that I would receive all of your gold, Loki said, pointing to the dwarf's pocket. And Vari handed the ring over, but silently placed a curse on it, saying that the ring would be the death of whoever owned it. Loki was aware of the curse and laughed as he took the ring, knowing that it would soon be Hridmar's. The gold was just enough to cover the otter's skin, but just before the gods handed over the wealth to the farmer, Odin noticed an especially beautiful ring as part of the hoard. He quietly pocketed it and handed the gold-covered hide over to Hridmar. Here is the restitution you are owed according to our agreement. Now will you let us go on our way? The farmer inspected the hide and after a long time said, There is still one whisker that remains exposed. Cover it too with gold or else you will not have fulfilled the terms of our deal. Odin sadly took the ring out of his pocket and placed it on the whisker. There we have kept our end of the bargain. Now you keep yours. Let us go. The gods were untied, and before they left, Loki gleefully told Hreidmar that the ring was cursed. Then they all returned to Asgard. Now the man's sons, Regan and Fafnir, demanded that they be given a portion of the gold, seeing as it was their brother who had been slain. But Hreidmar scoffed at them saying he had no intention of giving either of them even a penny. Enraged, the brothers slew him where he stood, and Fafnir attempted to run off with the gold. But Regan grabbed him, demanding that he be given half the hoard, which was only fair. Fafnir refused. Fafnir then fled to a deserted plain, hiding his hoard in a nearby cave, and turned himself into a gigantic dragon that lay on his treasure day and night. Odin, Loki, and Honir are once again on a journey, this time in a barren and mountainous land. There was no food to be found, and the three were getting hungrier and hungrier. Finally, after rounding a corner, they caught sight of a valley below them, filled with oxen grazing. After cooking the oxen they had caught, they pulled the meat out of the fire, but to their surprise, it was as cold and as uncooked as when they had started. They tried to cook the meat a second time, 
but once again, it was as cold and raw as when they began. As they debated why it could be that the meat was so cold, a voice spoke from above. It is I who have rendered your fire useless. If you will give me a share of your meat, I will release my magic and allow your fire to cook. The gods agreed to this deal, and after the meat was cooked, the eagle chose the best pieces of meat for himself. This greatly angered Loki, who immediately attempted to strike at the bird. As his branch hit the bird in the back, it immediately stuck, and as the eagle flew away, he carried Loki with him. The bird barreled across the landscape, just low enough so that Loki's legs slammed into trees, boulders, and mountains. Finally, as Loki felt that his body was to be ripped apart, he begged with his captor to let him go. The eagle, however, laughed at him, and Loki begged and pleaded some more. Finally, the bird spoke. Well, there is one thing you could do to secure your release, but one thing only. I have seen how you gods are nourished by the succulent fruits that are kept by the beautiful goddess Idun. Because you eat that fruit, you never grow old nor die of age. Swear an oath to me here and now that you will bring me both Idun and her fruit, and I will set you down. Loki gave him his word, and so was returned to Asgard. He told Aiden that he had found a grove outside of Asgard's walls where fruit grew that was even greater than her own. The trickster suggested that she bring a basket of her own fruits so that they could compare the two. Aiden had a hard time believing Loki, but there was no way she was passing on this opportunity. When the two of them were far enough from Asgard, the eagle, who was in fact the giant Thajazi, swooped in and carried the goddess away to his home in Thrymheim, an icy and desolate land in the mountains of Jotunheim, where no plants grew and no birds sang. Now that Aiden and her fruit was gone, the gods began to age. Their skin wrinkled and their hair turned white. Their bodies became frail and sick. They held a long council to figure out what had gone wrong, and when they determined that the goddess had last been seen with Loki, they sighed in embarrassment. Of course, it was Loki. The trickster was dragged in front of the assembled gods, who threatened him with a slow and painful death if he did not return Aiden and her fruit. Terrified, Loki agreed to find the goddess, but said that first, he would need something from them. Freya, who was the most anxious about her rapidly receding looks, owned a set of hawk wings that allowed the wearer to turn into a hawk. Loki said that he required them and Freya instantly granted his wish. Now in hawk form, Loki arrived in Thrymheim and found Aiden alone in Thajazi's house. He immediately changed the goddess into a nut, picked her up, and began to return to Asgard. However, when Thajazi returned home, he figured out exactly what had happened and took off for the home of the gods. When the Aesir saw a hawk flying towards them with an eagle in pursuit, they immediately spread out piles of sawdust and kindling along their walls. The moment Loki had passed through their borders, they threw torches on the fuel, causing massive flames to roar into the sky. Tajazi tried to turn back, but his momentum proved to be his undoing. He flew straight into the flames and fell to the ground in Asgard. As he writhed in pain, the gods gathered around and finished him. And so youth and Aiden was returned to Asgard. While the gods were feasting in celebration of Thajazi's death, a figure burst into their feast. The guest was the giantess named Skadi, daughter of Thajazi, who had arrived seeking to avenge her father. However, the gods treated her nicely, and after a long negotiation, she agreed to receive compensation instead of revenge. First, Odin would take Thajazi's eyes and turn them into two stars in the night sky. Second, the gods would have to make her laugh, but no matter what they tried, they failed to amuse her. Finally, Loki had a tug-of-war contest with a goat where he tied the rope around This proved to be enough to make the giantess giggle. The final compensation was that Skadi would receive a god of her choice in marriage, but she could only pick him by the sight of his legs and feet alone. So, she picked the fairest pair of legs she saw thinking that they would belong to Baldur. However, they actually belonged to the sea god Njord. The two would have a magnificent wedding feast, but shortly afterwards when they decided on where to live, 
tension began to rise. Njord's home was called Noatun, the place of ships, which was a bright and warm land. In contrast, Thrymheim could not have been more different, a dark and ominous place where the snow never leaves. First, the two would spend nine nights in Thrymheim, and when the time was over, Njord declared that the land was loathsome. He hated the sounds of the wolves, which was a stark contrast to the gentle swans he was used to. Then, after nine nights in Noatun, Skadi declared that the land was loathsome. She hated the cries of the seabirds who made it impossible to sleep, and so she departed for the mountains and departed from her husband. The marriage of Njord and Skadi will be one of the last happy events in Norse mythology. Everything from here on gets darker and darker. Baldr is one of the sons of Odin, and is also the most beloved of all the gods. One night, he began to have terrible, ominous nightmares. When he told his fellow gods about his plight, a council was immediately assembled to figure out what to do. The gods determined that they could not decide on what action to take until they knew what the dreams meant. So Odin was sent off to find the meaning of his son's terrible dreams. The Allfather traveled across the World Tree until he finally made his way to the roots of Yggdrasil and the land of the dead. It was there that the dog that guarded the door barked furiously at the god. Thankfully, Odin had made this trip many times before and knew exactly how to charm the god. In the underworld, Odin made his way to the Hall of Hell, the Death Goddess. The hall was set with many tables, as if in preparation for a welcome feast. Odin pushed his way past the tables and towards the grave of a powerful sorceress. He weaved his spells and magic so that she was able to sit upright and speak to him in a trance. I have been dead for so long. Rain has rained upon me. Snow has snowed upon me. And dew has settled upon me many times. Now a stranger has awakened me. Who are you? Odin said that he was named Vegtam, or the Traveler. He asked the woman to tell him who was so important to have the High Hall of the Dead prepared as it was. The mead has been brewed, and the table has been set for Baldur while we are celebrating his arrival. The gods will be weeping over him at his funeral. I have said more than I would have liked to do. It is time for me to go back to sleep. No, please, stay awake a little longer. Who will snatch away Baldur's life from him? It shall be Hod, who bears in his hand a slender branch that will soon become world famous. And now, at last, I will return to my slumber. Wise women, before you do, just one more question, please. Now I see that you are no victim, but rather Odin, that old necromancer. Go home. I will answer no more of your questions, and no one will get another out of me until Loki breaks free from his bonds, and the giants meet the gods at Ragnarok. Even though the gods knew of Baldur's fate, they refused to accept it. Freya, Baldur's mother, went to everything in the universe. Every animal, plant, element, disease, and anything else that could be found, and made them swear solemn oaths that they would never harm her son in any way. The gods rejoiced. The prophecy was wrong, and they had defeated fate itself. They began to throw anything they could get their hands on at Baldur, and laughed as axes, swords, arrows, and stones began to bounce off of him without causing the slightest wound. One god, however, had an idea. Loki, of course, disguised himself as an ordinary woman and went to Freya. He asked her if there was anything in the universe which she had failed to get an oath from. Well, I didn't bother to ask the mistletoe. After all, it's such a small and weak thing. What damage could it possibly do to Baldur? Loki immediately began to create a spear out of the mistletoe that grew in Valhalla. The next day, he took his spear to where the gods were throwing things 
at the invincible Balder. He found Hod, Balder's blind brother, who was standing behind all of the assembled gods. Oh, my dear friend, it's simply improper that you alone of all the gods are not honoring Balder by demonstrating his invincibility to all present. He gave Hod the mistletoe spear and directed him on where exactly to throw it. Fire! The gods began to weep. Odin especially felt the loss of his son, for he knew that this was a sign that you could not escape fate. That when Ragnarok came, all the assembled gods would lie just as dead as Baldur did. Finally, Freya spoke. My son is surely now in hell with the other shades of the dead. If any of you will volunteer to travel to that gloomy realm and negotiate Baldur's release, you will earn my eternal esteem and love. One god stepped forward. Baldur's brother, Hermod, volunteered for the mission. Odin allowed him to borrow his eight-legged horse, and so he rode off towards hell. Baldur's funeral was a magnificent affair. He was placed on a giant ship to serve as his funeral pyre and sent into the sea. Thor himself lit the fire over the ship, and Odin placed his ring from which eight others would fall from into the blaze. As gods, elves, dwarves, and even some giants looked on, the fire consumed the entire boat, only finishing when it sank beneath the waves. Once the boat had disappeared, the water and air became perfectly still. At the same time, Hermod was still riding that eight-legged horse towards the underworld. He rode for nine nights through valleys that grew deeper and darker, until finally the lack of daylight became such that he could not see at all. Then, in the darkness before him, he spied a glint of gold and came upon a golden bridge crossing the river Njol, which circled the underworld. Standing before the bridge was a terrifying giantess. Who are you and what kind of being? Yesterday, five whole armies of dead men passed over this bride, but it shakes just the same when you cross it alone. And for that matter, you have more color in your face than a dead man does. I have been sent to seek Balder in Hell. Have you seen him? She responded, saying that the god had passed through the bridge some time ago. The giantess stepped aside to allow Hermod through. On the far side was the closed gates of Hell, but luckily Sleipnir was able to jump over the gate and into the fields of the underworld. The two made their way to Hell's high hall, and Hermod entered alone. Inside was Balder, sitting beside the goddess herself. Hermod begged with Hell to let his brother go free. He told her how everything in the universe was weeping in his absence. Hell listened to the claims. And when he finished, she spoke. You say that all the gods and their creation weep for Baldur. That claim can be put to the test, and that is what I propose to do. If you can make every last creature in the cosmos cry and mourn over the loss of Baldur, then I will allow him to return to the world of the living. But if even one stone, one flea, or one blade of grass withholds its tears, then Baldur shall remain with me. Hermod quickly agreed to these terms and thanked Hel for her mercy. When Hermod returned to Asgard, the gods quickly set about making sure that everything in the universe was weeping for Baldur. Every elf, dwarf, human, plant, mountain, river, and star was in mourning. However, the gods soon came upon a lone giantess named Thok in a cave, whose eyes were dry. I never loved that churl of yours. Let Hel hold what she has. Some say that Thok was none other than Loki in disguise, and they are probably right. Baldur would remain with Hel until Ragnarok came. The sea giant Aegir got along well with the gods of Asgard, and so it has invited them all to a massive feast in his hall. Everyone except Thor showed up, for he was too busy slaying giants. When the masses of gods and elves arrived, they were shown in by two servants named Eldir and Fimifang. The ale was served, and everyone was happy and joyful, saying that Aegir's servants were some of the greatest in the Nine Realms. All of this attention on the servants made Loki jealous. So when Fimifang came near him, 
Loki drew his sword and slew him where he stood. The rest of the gods screamed in anger at Loki and chased him out of the hall and into the forest. For a time, Loki sat in his anger. Then he stood and marched back towards the hall, grabbing the servant Eldir by the arm. Tell me, Eldir, what are the guests talking about now? Answer me, or I'll make sure that you never take another step. They are talking about their accomplishments in war and how marvelous their weapons are. If I were you, Loki, I would not go back in there, for you will find no one well disposed toward you. I'm going in anyway. The gods deserve to have their boasts ruined like poison in their drinks. He violently shoved the servant aside and entered the hall. The guests all scowled at Loki entering. I'm thirsty after my long journey. Someone pour me a drink. Bragi, Valhalla's bard, spoke up. The gods know very well who they want at their feasts and who they don't. They've made the mistake of finding you a seat with them in the past, but they will surely do so no more. Don't you remember, Odin, we once mixed our blood together? On that occasion, you promised you'd never taste alcohol unless both of us drank together. Go ahead and give the wolf's father what he wants, lest he should speak ill of us here. Hail to you gods! Hail to you goddesses! Hail to all of you! Well, except Bragi over there. I'll give you a horse, a sword, and a ring if you can hold yourself together and not incite any more anger in the hearts of the gods. You've never been rich enough in horses, swords, or rings to make such an offer. But perhaps you would be if you had ever shown the slightest bit of bravery in battle. If it were not for the fact that we're guests in another's hall, I'd pay you the price you deserve for your lies by chopping off your head here and now. Consider husband. How close in kinship he is to the others here. Stop this rash chatter between the two of you. Shut up, Idun. Of all of the goddesses here, you may be the worst of all. Remember that time you wrapped your arms around the man who killed your own brother? It doesn't strike me as wise, Loki, to incur the wrath of Eden. Shut up, Odin. You meddle in the outcomes of countless battles, yet not once have you awarded victory justly. To the lesser party you grant a resounding triumph, and to the greater a crushing defeat. Well, at least it wasn't me who lived underground for eight winters, milking the cows like a woman and even bearing children. But it wasn't me who donned the dress of a woman and traveled among men as a witch, chanting, beating the drum, and casting spells. Neither of you should speak of the deeds you did in olden times. Shut up, Freya. Speaking of olden times, do you recall that you slept with Vili and Vey while your husband was away? If Balder, my hawkish son, were here by my side, you wouldn't emerge from this hall alive. Would you like to know why Balder isn't here, Freya? I myself prevented him from coming, though much for your son's fabled strength. It seems to me that it's no big deal if a woman has an affair here and there, but it's a marvel that such a taunt would come from a man so argur that he's born children of his own. Shut up, Njord. You once let a giantess use your mouth as an outhouse. Fenrir howls and rattles his chains impotently for millennia on end, and so shall you, Loki, if you don't master your tongue. Frey, the only way you could get a wife was by buying her from her father with gold. When the fire giants ride from Muspelheim to torch your pretty little world, you will find yourself helpless against them. Enjoy your freedom while it lasts. Soon the gods will bind you in chains made from the bowels of your own son, whose body will be as cold as ice. Perhaps it is so, but the last sight your father Thiazi ever saw was me as I slew him. Surely that is Thor returning from his journey. When he gets here, he won't put up with this slimy disparager for long. Arger wretch! Keep your mouth closed or I'll close it for you with my hammer. Then I'll rip your neck from your shoulders and that will be the end of you. Thor, why treat me so coarsely? Save your energy for when you have to fight the Great Serpent at Ragnarok. End your insults now, or I'll throw your helpless body to the giants and let them do with you what they will. Everything I have spoken here tonight has been true, and all of you know it. But all of us also know that I am no match for the great Thor, so here I will cease to speak my mind and go forth from this splendid hall. Aegir, your feasts and your ale have lived up to their reputation. It is perfectly plain why you are so famous a host but enjoy your banquets while you can, because in less time than you may think, the flames of Ragnarok will leap and dance through your hall and all over your body. And so the trickster fled.
with the other gods in furious pursuit. Loki fled as fast as he could until finally he lost his pursuers in the deep wilderness. He would live on top of a mountain, building a house with four doors so he could see the land below in all directions. When the fear of the gods finding him was too great, he would turn into a salmon and hide underneath a waterfall in a nearby stream. Loki hid for many months, but eventually the day he feared came to pass. Loki was weaving a new fishing net when he saw a group of people approaching. In a panic, he flung the net into the fire and vanished from the house. When the gods entered, it was the wise Kvasser who noticed the remains of a net in the fire. After examining it, they knew it must have been used for fishing, and so decided to make a second net that looked the same as the first. After finishing the net, they went down to the stream and cast it into the waterfall. Loki, in the form of a salmon, dodged the net just in time. The gods pulled the net out, this time adding weights to it so that it would catch everything that was in the bottom of the stream. Once again, Loki narrowly avoided the trap. He saw that the open ocean was near. One short jump was all it would take for him to be free. Loki leapt over the net and out of the stream, hoping to swim to safety, but Thor caught him in his hand mid-flight. Loki squirmed and wriggled, trying to escape, but Thor held him firmly by the tail. His grip left the salmon with a tapered back, which it still has to this day. The gods carried Loki to a cave where they brought two of his sons before him. They turned one into a wolf and made him watch as the wolf brutally tore apart the other's son. Then they would draw the entrails from the man's corpse and use them to tie Loki to the rocks in the cave. Scotty approached Loki with a massive viper in her hands. This is your payment for killing my father, Thiazi. She placed the serpent above Loki so that its venom would drip from its jaws onto his forehead. Every time Loki would shriek in pain, his movements shook the earth itself. His only mercy was that his wife, Sigyn, was permitted to hold a bowl over his head to catch the poison from the snake. However, when the bowl becomes full and she has to leave the cave, a few drops of venom would hit Loki in the head, causing him to cry out in pain. This is the source of all earthquakes. Loki would stay in that cave till the end of days. One day, perhaps tomorrow, perhaps next year, or perhaps a millennium from now, that dark age will come to pass. The army of countless warriors that Odin has assembled in Valhalla will stream out of their hall to meet their destiny. The tension between the giants and the gods will finally reach a breaking point, and the cosmos itself will hold its breath. The first sign of Ragnarok will be the Fimble Winter. Three great horrible winters with no summer in between. Darkness, snow, ice, and wind will cover the earth, and the sun's rays will barely reach the surface. Both brothers, fathers, and sons will kill each other in this dark age until all the shields on earth are broken into pieces. The wolves, who have pursued the sun and moon for thousands of years, will finally reach them and swallow both sources of light. Under the eternal darkness, earthquakes will shake each of the nine realms, and Yggdrasil itself will tremble. Heimdall will surely blow his horn to warn the gods of the disaster. Odin will surely talk to Mimir's severed head, hoping beyond reason that there is something that can be done. He will not like the answer he receives. Then all those monsters who the gods have worked so hard to get rid of will free themselves from their bonds. Jormungan will rise from the ocean onto the land, displacing so much water that no one will be able to tell where the land ends and the ocean begins. Fenrir will finally break the chain from which he is bound and run furiously across the earth, devouring everything under the sky. Nagolfar, a ship made from the fingernails of all dead men and women, will be released from the bottom of the ocean, and the gods will recoil in terror on seeing the giants manning its countless oars and the helm captained by Loki himself. The fire giants will finally arrive from Muspelheim, led by Surtur swinging his flaming sword that is brighter than the sun. When they cross the Bifrost Bridge, it will snap and break underneath their weight, and the giants will ransack and pillage Asgard, forcing the gods to flee their home. Finally, everyone will make their way to the plains of Vigrid, the place of surging battle. 
On one side will stand all of the giants, with Fenrir, Jormungand, and Loki. And on the other will stand all of the gods, along with the warriors of Valhalla. Odin will surely strike first, riding into battle atop his eight-legged horse against Fenrir the wolf, who will swallow the Allfather whole. Vidar, Odin's son, will stride forth and rip the wolf's jaws apart, ending the massive beast. Thor surely would have intervened to avenge his father, but he will be too busy fighting Jormungand. Their battle will cover the plains in lightning, thunder, and venom. The two eternal foes finally face each other. In the end, Thor will defeat the snake, but be so full of the monster's poison that he will take only nine steps before falling dead to the ground. Heimdall, the most loyal of the gods, will face Loki, the most disloyal, and in their battle, both will be slain. Tyr, Frey, Surt, and all other gods and giants will also perish in this manner. Surtr's fire will have covered the world, and with no gods left to hold it together, the earth will sink into the sea. The silence, stillness, and emptiness of Ganungagap will return and reign forever.